Good morning. Yeah, I know you guys feel like I do at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. We had the pennant bowl VIP dinner last night and it was so much fun and we had free drink tickets. And I knew I had to give a talk today and didn't need the dehydration from alcohol. So I had to sit there and watch all of you have wonderful drinks, <laughs> beer and fruity drinks and green drinks and peat drinks and white Russians. And just so we're good on the record, at this moment, I don't like you a whole lot for that reason. <laughs> now, I'll get over it. I, I promise I will. Tonight, when we have a drink together, I'll definitely be okay with it. But um, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I, I like all of you, even with you drinking in front of me when I couldn't do it. Um, as Thomas said, I came out in 2012. I had been a pastor for a very long time. I was raised extremely fundamentalist. Uh, my dad was a pastor. And I had always wanted to be a minister. That's all I could ever dream of, was just being in the pulpit and being a pastor and caring for people. And I finally achieved that dream and was living it and living the call. Of course, in ministry and Christian faith, you don't call it a dream. It's the call of God on your life. It's much more important because God spoke to me and called me. You may have had your drink in front of me, but God actually spoke to me. So I get that one on you. Um, but something started happening in my life and the questions that... For whatever reason, I was just curious. My sisters say I think too much, which is true, actually. And those little things would pop up every now and then, and I would quickly squash them and send them away to the little dungeon in the back of my mind. But you can't do that forever, or at least I couldn't do that forever. And by 2011, late part of 2011, I thought for sure I was something like an agnostic. The atheist word was really a bad word. It just could not be something that I was. But I, f I came into the clergy project in that time frame, and it wasn't very much past that, much, much longer past that. I'm trying to think of the dates at 10 o'clock in the morning, um, that I realized that the big A word is actually what had happened in my life. And I panicked. I hated it. I didn't want it to be true. Uh, I didn't want to leave the church. I didn't want to leave ministry or my faith. I, I loved it. It's all I ever knew. But once you know, you know, and you can't unknow. So I started working on a plan to get out, and I, that plan didn't quite work out. And at the American Atheist Convention, following the Reason Rally of all places, an opportunity presented itself to me to go up on stage and talk about the clergy project. And I was so frustrated and so depressed and so desperate that I got up there and looked at faces just like yours and some of them were your faces and in that moment I was overcome with grief over the way that I had evangelized and you know I don't think I ever hated you that's just I really don't hate but I definitely thought you were wrong very very wrong and if I didn't change you you were in big trouble and as I stood up there, I started to apologize to everyone and, and just came out in front of the entire audience and video cameras, which I didn't think about that one. <laughs> yeah, this thing called YouTube, oh God. By the time I got home, it was viral and life as I knew it, it completely disappeared. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea what life looked like without God, without being a Christian, without being a minister. I, I was completely as if I had just stepped off a cliff or stepped out of the airlock of a, of a space station and couldn't get back to it. No way to navigate, no way to understand, no way to put the pieces together at all. And so I had to learn, and I am still learning, trust me, it's, it'll be four years in April, and I am definitely not an expert on the subject, but I do have some things that I've learned on how to survive, you know, life after faith. And you may be thinking, well, I've never been a Christian, I've never been religious, or maybe I was just kind of moderately religious, a religious, a cultural phenomenon. But this applies to you as well, because the reality is it's not just those of us 
who come out of faith who have to deal with this stuff every single day of our lives. It is literally just surviving without faith. It is going into, for me sometimes, going into the grocery store and people that I used to know seeing me. And whether they say anything to me or not, you know what they're thinking, and they avoid you. They turn and go down the other aisle. And that hurts. Um, it's sometimes people saying awful things about you. Uh, sometimes if you get in front of a camera and a lot of people and do what I did, it's people giving you, sending you death threats. Uh, it, it was very odd for me because I had always been liked. People had always loved me and loved what, I'm, what I was doing. And, you know, I'm not bragging about that. I'm just kind of easygoing and I like people and people like me in return. And in a moment, people hated me. And that's really tough. And I know some of you have experienced the very same things and are experiencing it. Some of you are not even able to come out openly because of the situation that you live in and the situation with your family or your job or, you know, a large assortment of things that, that keep you trapped. And that, all of these situations require survival. So I decided that, actually a few weeks ago, I, ch <laughs> I changed up when they said, oh, send us the title to your talk. And I was like, oh, crap, I think I'm going to change it. I, I, I dreamed this one, actually. And no, I wasn't watching the movies or reading the books at the time. Um, when I first heard about the books, interestingly enough, in 2008 when they came out, I preached against them. This was horrible stuff. I mean, of course I preached against a lot of movies. You know, Da Vinci Code, all those things. They were just evil. They were, they were immoral, hateful, you know, bad, bad stuff. And that carried with me all the way up until 2012. I was working at American Atheists and had run out of things to read. And my coworker, Amanda Kniff, said, have you read The Hunger Games? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not reading that. That's young adult fiction. Why in the world would I read that? I read things that are more meaty, more solid. She says, you, read, you need to read those. Those are really good books. And, you know, she's, she's a bright cookie. If you've ever met Amanda, you know she's, she's a lot smarter than I am, that's for sure. So I thought, all right, all right, you know, I caved to the pressure. And I downloaded the book on my Kindle that day, and I could not go to sleep that night. I had to read the first book and finish it. And the reason that it captured my attention, and it has captured... So many people, uh, young and old alike, has captured the attention of, of people, become this huge phenomenon in movies. The new movie, I think it's the final installment, is coming out in November. It's because of the story. It's because of what we can take away from it. And this is nothing new. There have been books throughout the history of writing books and stories that inspire us, that we pull things from, and we take those things and walk away from them Maybe we knew them already. Maybe we just needed to be reminded of them. Maybe they're things that we had never thought of. And that's what the movie, uh, the books initially in the movie remind me of. And that's the principles that keep us from this movie that will keep us moving forward and help us to survive. When Suzanne Collins wrote the book, she gave an interview and said that she was actually inspired by the, the Greek story of, yeah, you say that word, Theseus and the Minotaur. In the story, Athens is going to be punished because of their crimes by being placed, they take seven men and seven, seven young men and seven maidens and put them into a big labyrinth and send a Minotaur in to them. And unlike the Hunger Games, there is no winner except the Minotaur, I guess, because if you go up against a half man, anyway, the big horns on his head right there, that's going to kill you no matter what. And so they are, they are killed. And she was just thinking about that as authors do at times and was inspired to write a book, but she also paired it up with reality TV. I mean, think about it. Kids are getting killed, Minotaur, Labyrinth, no way out in reality TV. That's pretty much like Jersey Shore, don't you think? <laughs> you know? It's, that makes perfect sense to me. And so she was inspired to write the books based upon these stories. And from these books and from this movie, if you've seen it, I'm 
that, then you know what I'm talking about. If you've not, or if you've read the books, if you've not, I'm not going to give a whole lot away. I'm not really into the spoiler alert kind of thing that all of you guys do on Twitter when I haven't watched it and it's on my DVR. So there you go. I don't like you for that one either. At least just post spoiler alert so when I look at the Twitter feed, I don't see it. The first thing in the movie and in the books that the heroine in the story, Katniss Everdeen, which, by the way, is a woman which I identify with a strong, you know, I look up to and want to be like a strong woman like she is. The first thing that she is instructed to do, that, which she really doesn't want to do, is to connect with people. And the, the stories, she's supposed to form alliances in order to survive. The way the books work, just for those of you who haven't read it, how many have not read it? Oh my goodness gracious. All right, all right, so back up here, we'll go back a little bit. The way the story works is there was, it's a diastopian post-apocalyptic future. And in this future, there, uh, there had been a huge war, obviously, because it's post-apocalyptic. And the government, the capital, needed to take control of the people. They wanted to subdue them. They wanted to make sure that there wasn't another uprising that came up. So they divided them up into districts. The districts essentially lived in poverty. They were all assigned a task. It's, it sounds kind of like divergent. And they produced these different things like coal or farming or other things and sent them up to the capital. And the way that the capital kept them subdued was every so often at a, at a pre-selected time, they had what is called the Hunger Games. And no, it's not the time when you try to get to McDonald's, not McDonald's, to Olive Garden or the other restaurants before the church folks let out on Sundays. <laughs> <coughs> this in actuality is they came to a time called the Reaping and all the kids 12 to 18 had to present themselves and be a, a poll, a lottery, was held and one young man and one young girl were selected to represent each district. They were dropped into an arena of sorts, it changed from, time, from each game to the next. And the goal was to win, but the way you had to win was you had to kill everyone else. And the last person alive was the winner, and they got a house, and they got food, and they didn't have to participate in the reaping, or their family didn't have to participate in the reaping ever again. The heroine of the story is a young girl who's 16. Her name is Katniss Everdeen. Uh, she's played by Jennifer Lawrence. You've probably heard of her. She's in the news a lot. Um, and when they gather for that, the reaping at the very beginning of the movie, her little sister, who is 12, Prim, her name is called to go forward and to be a tribute in the games. And she is just d beside herself, distraught. And as they start to take her up, she runs out of the crowd and pushes the guards away and says, no, 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 I volunteer, I'll go in her place. I'll take her place. And that begins the story. It begins on this huge emotional thing of her voluntarily stepping forward and stepping into this, this place that she knows is going to be very difficult. And that is where we find ourselves as well many times. I mean, goodness gracious, when I was standing at American Atheist and came off that stage, you could definitely say I had been part of the reaping and was going to be thrown into the games where everybody was going to try to kill me because I wouldn't kill them. I'm just not that kind of person. But the principle is the same. It's difficult. We know what's in front of us. We know what's waiting for us on the other side. But we do it anyway. We live it anyway. And for those who are not able to come out, those of us who are, we are the ones who have volunteered for you. We have stood up and said, I volunteer as a tribute. I volunteer. You, know, you can't do this. You're not ready for it. The circumstances are not right in your area. So I'm going to do it. And that's where it all starts. And as the story progresses, when she is actually brought into the arena, she is instructed, as I said, to form alliances. Try to make connections with the people that are in the games with you because you won't survive on your own. 
You won't make it on your own. Of course, the objective is, is you form alliances until most everybody's killed off and then you kill your alliances. Now, I'm not saying do that, no, okay? <laughs> We're going to skip over that part. And since most of you haven't read the books, that's okay. I can, I can make you skip over that part. But, but the principle is the same. If you are a non-believer and you are out, or even if you're not out, it is the connections is the first thing that's going to help you. It's the first thing that is going to be so important that you, I mean, you just can't skip over it. You know, it has been shown in psychology numerous times, and Abraham Maslow and a lot of others have shown that, that this thing of connectedness with human beings is it's essential to us. It's, it's one of those things that we can't live without. And as a non-believer, it's even more important. And if you're not out, you can still connect, thanks to Facebook, you know, thanks to social media, thanks to uh, other private groups that are online. You know, if you are out, there's meetup groups, there are recovering from religion groups, there's conferences like this. There are places and ways that you can connect. There are podcasts that you can listen to. Before I came out, I mean, of course, I had no one to talk to. I wouldn't go anywhere at all. The, meeting or anything like that. I, I did have a false identity on Facebook where I connected with, with some folks, but the big thing that really helped me was listening to podcasts. I didn't know the people that were, were talking. I didn't know, you know Seth Andrews or, or Matt Dillahunty or any of those, those folks, but I felt connected to them. I felt something through that human voice that's speaking to me and encouraging me. That's the thing that will help us to survive as we try to live our life without faith in a world where faith is everything. Being connected. The second thing that comes through the movie, I remember she's 16 years old and she steps forward and she volunteers because she believes in protecting those that she loves. But throughout the stories, in the books and the movies, you'll see that she feels that she's not capable of doing this. She feels weak. She feels like she is going to let everybody down and that if anybody is counting on her for anything, then they've counted on the wrong person. But as the story moves forward, you, you find that she suddenly or, or gradually becomes aware of the fact that she is actually stronger than she believes. And you are too. Trust me. I did not think that I was a strong person at all, and I still really don't. I've had people over the last few years come up to me at conferences and say, oh, Teresa, you are so brave. It took so much courage to do that, and, and you were just so strong and so much strength, and the reality is, is oh my goodness, it was an accident, really. <laughs> it was an act of desperation. But the, deep inside, there is a strength, and I've discovered it. Does that mean that I go out every day going, yes, I am strong and I can do this and I will stand? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that sometimes people say something to me or about me and I crumple up in a ball and stay in my room for a couple of days. But that's okay because strength doesn't mean that you're, you're never weak or that you never feel defeated. Strength means that you keep going. That's what strength is. That's what courage is. It's the ability to not let them keep you down. It's not standing up on a stage at a conference and giving a talk or, or any of those things. It is going out there into your communities, at, at your work, in your, wherever your life takes you, and standing up and going again and again and again and enduring those things because you know the eventual outcome is that awareness will continue to grow, that people will continue to see that, hey, I'm your neighbor. I'm just like you. I cut my grass. I may do it on Sunday morning, yes, but I cut my grass. I trim my yard. I take my kids to the 4-H club. Oh, I'm living in Alabama now. You will probably don't know what 4-H is. Uh, I take my kids to baseball practice. There you go. Um, you know, I live my life in the same way that you live your life. It's just in one particular area we don't agree, and that's a matter of faith. Eventually, that will change, but for now, it hasn't. And so we have to have this 
ability to survive. Being connected is the first part of it, but the second part is you have to know that you are strong. Whether you feel like it or not, whether you have a bad day or not, whether you keep trying and trying and trying and hitting a brick wall, none of that matters. You are still strong. There is still strength inside of you. You know, the old word for it is intestinal fortitude. And no, that's not what happens when you are not able to, you know. <laughs> intestinal fortitude means that you dig down deep inside of you and you find something that you never dreamed was there and it propels you forward. It gives you that strength and courage and bravery that we admire in other people so much. It allows you to pull from that special something that we all, all have and to keep going one step forward at a time. One of my favorite books of all time, absolute favorite, is Winnie the Pooh. A, I'm a softie. There's this, this line is in the stories and it has meant so much to me, especially over the last few years. So there's something you must always remember. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. And that's what I'm saying to you today. Whether you believe it or not, you are brave. Whether you feel it or not, you are strong. And whether you understand how smart you are, you are. You're intelligent and brave and courageous, and you can do this. If I can do it, trust me, you can do it. In whatever way, shape, or form it takes in your circumstance and situation, you can tap into this strength and bravery and courage and live it every single day of your life. So we're connected, and now we are recognizing there's a strength within us. But the, the piece for this, the stories in the book that really, really got to me is this element of hope. And I know that in our movement, hope is sometimes a dirty word. And I really, really disagree with that. Because hope isn't a magic word. You know, the Christians can't have that one. You know, they've stolen so many things, but they can't have hope. We have to all have hope. Hope is that thing that lets you know it gets better. Hope is that thing that keeps you getting up and moving forward. Hope is the thing that allows you to get up and get out of bed. I mean, to look forward to the future, to see that there is something that's there, something that's worth it, something that is more valuable than anything else, and you're willing to fight for it. The old saying is, is that you believe in something enough that you're willing to die for it. Well, that's a good statement, and I agree with it, but in reality, there are things that are just as important, if not more important, <clears throat> that we should be willing to live for. And hope is one of those. Hope is defined as a feeling of desire for something and a confidence in the possibility of its fulfillment. This is what we talked about just a moment ago, is that we do these things. We connect with others. We, we take those community connections to encourage us. We tap into this strength, we begin to believe that we are brave in some way. We, we begin to think, well, maybe I am strong enough. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I can handle it. And that leads us to hope because there is a possibility that things are going to change. Things have changed and they continue to. And that is the basis of our hope. As I said, we're not hoping for heaven. We realize there is no heaven. And so all we've got is this life. And if we want to have a life for our kids, our nieces and nephews, our cousins, or just any of the children that are coming up, the, the teenagers or the friend, you know, the person sitting next to you, if there's any possibility that they're going to have it easier, that they're going to be able to say openly, nah, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm a humanist, I, or I'm an agnostic, or I'm a free thinker, or I'm a Christian, or I'm a nun, or I'm a dun. If we're ever going to say those things, we have to be propelled by hope and toward hope. 
For those of you who haven't seen the movies, I have a little bit of the movie to show you. Um, this deals with this idea of hope. The two people that you're going to see in this scene are President Snow. He is the maniacal leader of the government <clears throat> who is trying his very dead level best to keep everything squashed, to keep rebellion at bay, to keep the, all the people just beat down and destroyed and never standing up for who they are and what they are. And then the other, the other person who's in this scene is the game master. He is the one who actually controls what happens in the arena, who sends the, the animals, the beasts, uh, you know, the storms, all the different things. I mean, you really got to go read the book or watch the movie after this. And then you'll be like, oh, wow, that's what she was talking about. Oh, man, that's amazing. So you have the game master, <clears throat> Seneca Crane, and you have President Snow in this scene. So don't pray, but let's see how it goes with the audio. Come on now, don't do this to me. Seneca, why do you think we have a winner? What do you mean? I mean, why do we have a winner? Hope. Hope? Hope. It is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. The spark is fine, as long as it's contained. So... So... Contain it. Okay, we don't want the commercial to that. You can't get a video without the commercial. I mean, it's just a fact of life. He made a statement during that, that scene that shows why we cannot give up the word hope. Hope is the only thing that is stronger than fear. Hope is the only thing that is stronger than hate. Hope is the only thing that is stronger than discrimination or persecution or prejudice or bigotry. Why? Because hope allows us to believe there is something more, there's something better, that what we are doing is making a difference. That is hope. That's why, in surviving these games, known as being a non-believer, surviving this life without faith, hope is the key that unlocks it. We've connected. We've got a community. We're strong. You know, alone you can do so little. Together we can do so much. Helen Keller stated in one of my favorite, favorite quotes, We've connected with people, connected with people who have the same dreams and the same passions and the same desire for this better future. We are beginning to attempt to try to realize that there's strength and bravery and courage in us for this task. But those only get us so far. We have to have this thing called hope. It has to be the motivation for whatever we do, whether you're an activist, or a blogger, or a podcaster, or a public speaker, or you work in nonprofit, or you're just a person who no longer believes and you live your life every day and you're a father, a mother, a parent, a, well, I guess you're a father, mother, parent, a grandparent, a child, a cousin, a nephew, a neighbor, a coworker, a student. Hope is what brings us to the place where things change. This story is about an unlikely heroine who became a symbol of hope. See, that's the, the thing about hope. We have it and we hold on to it and, and we, we use it, we believe it, and it moves us forward. But when we have hope, it shows other people that things are getting better, that things will get better, that there is a possibility of a different future for everyone. And you are a symbol of hope. In the movie, Katniss becomes this, this huge rallying cry. She becomes the mocking jay. Watch the movie, read the book, you'll understand it. The point is, is that she 
inspires the people to stand up, to rise up, and to fight against the capital, to do the thing that they never believed that they could, to join together, to connect, to find that inner strength, that intestinal fortitude, to believe that there can be a different future for them. And it's because one person had this hope, and one person lived the hope and showed it, and it, it transferred to them. I mean, it's infectious. It's something that we can't do without. She was a symbol of change, a rebellious spirit who had an opportunity to change the world. And it was simply by doing those very things, by surviving, by living, <coughs> by, <coughs> pardon me, by being, offering hope. And I don't think in the book at all she was ever aware that what she was doing was strong or brave or courageous or was going to, to provide hope. I don't think that she ever really realized that. Um, as I said, when I stood up in front of a crowd, I certainly didn't think that. I thought I was pretty weak and pretty timid and shy and couldn't handle very much. Life had been pretty easy for me up to that point, actually. Um, but once you get put into the, to the race, into the games, you find out that it's all there waiting inside for someone, for you, to engage and to move forward and to live with that hope. Now, I have one more clip for you. This one takes place um, at one of the districts. It is a district where a young girl named Rue lived. The story behind that is during the games, this girl who was 12 years old, a little tiny, sweet, innocent girl, who didn't even have it in her to try to fight, she would just, she was good at hiding. <laughs> and she would run and find a place and hide. And they met up with each other. And for Katniss, Rue reminded her of her sister with just that innocence and gentleness. And it gave her that connection that she needed that was um, not somebody who was trying to kill her while she slept, but someone who loved her and needed her. And she, you know, they each drew strength from, from one another. And they concocted a plan to attempt to destroy the real, real bad guys that were coming after them to try and kill them. And Rue was going to set some fires, and Katniss was going to go. She's an archer, excellent archer. She was going to go and, and shoot an arrow that was going to blow up all these mines and supplies and such. Again, read the book. You'll understand it. And the fire, the smoke from the fire was going to distract them and bring them away from the campsite while she did the destruction, and, and Rue was supposed to go and hide. Then they were going to meet back up. And everything went according to plan, and when Katniss came back, after she had blown up the supplies and blown up the campsite, Rue comes running out to greet her, but one of the bad, bad, bad ones had followed her. And so when Rue stepped out, and I know I'm giving away a spoiler, I'm sorry, it's really important. The person threw a spear and killed her. And of course, you can imagine how devastated Katniss was. This was her only connection with sanity, with compassion and love and caring in, in a crazy Lord of the Flies kind of situation. She was so angry about it that she became defiant at that point. She laid, <clears throat> she laid the young girl out gathered a bunch of flowers and decorated all around her, crossed her hands over her, over her heart, you know, giving her a proper burial, giving her honor. And because the games are broadcast all over the districts, everybody saw what she was doing. As she walked away, she turned and looked up at the cameras, and she did something in particular, which you're going to see in this scene. It was a three-finger salute. I know you know the one finger, but the three finger salute took place. The person would, would raise their three fingers in the left hand, kiss their lips, and raise it. And it was a sign of unity for people who were trying and working to survive an extremely difficult situation. It was generally shown when the person was going into a situation where they were most likely going to die. She turns and she looks at that camera after she defies them by giving this young woman, who was very brave and courageous, a proper burial and honoring her. And 
with attitude from that strength from within, she, raised, she gives them that salute and stands there. And it is that moment when the hope is transferred. It is in that moment when she finally discovered, probably not even knowing what was happening, that there was strength within her, that the people of the districts realized there's something more. There is the possibility of a different future. If this person is brave enough to stand up, to come out, to take this risk for her sister, to go through this extremely difficult thing, life and death, survive, still not knowing whether she's going to live through it, but honor Rue and honor that life and then stand there. And you could say she was giving them the finger, essentially. It inspired them. It inspired the hope. So in this, this scene, she has come back after her time in the, the games, and she is speaking at the district where Rue lived, which is the 11th district. So let's not pray, but hope the second one works. We're, we're one for one. We'll try two for two. I did know Rue. She wasn't just my ally, she was my friend. I see her in the flowers that grow in the meadow by my house. I hear her in a mocking day song. I see her in my sister Prim. She was too young, too gentle. And I couldn't save her. I'm sorry. That's the turning point in the movie. When she's back, she stands in front of them, completely, brutally honest, and they raise their hands in the salute, showing unity for those who are trying to survive. As the scene continues, you see the images from all over the districts, the 12 districts, people doing the same thing. And thousands and thousands of people, hundreds of thousands, standing and saying, we believe, we have hope that there is a possibility of a better future and we're willing to fight for it. We're willing to do whatever it takes. She inspired them. She came to this point and said, some things are worth it. Some challenges, even though they're very great, we have to take them because people are counting us. Yes, the title of this talk is, is you know, how we can survive, but it's not just about us. It's never just about us. If it were, we wouldn't get very far, would we? It's about all of us. It's about how we can survive. It's about how we can live as a non-believer in a hostile world. It's about how we can latch on to that hope for other people, for those who are with us now, and for those who are coming up after us. Now, I have two sons, and one is a non-believer, and the other one is a, I really don't care. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. Um, he refuses a label. <clears throat> I don't know what you'd call him. He's a nun. Hopefully, they're going to have kids one day. I really hope, and I hope they're going to be little girls. <laughs> but when they have those sweet, sweet little kids, and I get to be a grandmommy, and I get to play with them, and, and take them to daycare, and drive them to school, and take them shopping, and let them buy anything they want because I'm grandma and I can, if they don't have faith, or if they're struggling with it, if it doesn't make sense, I want to make damn sure they can say so. That they don't have to live this life that I'm living. 
that they don't have to be a part of the environment that we are a part of. That they don't have to experience the loss of people that they love for no other reason than they don't believe the same way. They don't believe in a, in a deity. I want to make sure that doesn't happen. And not just for my grandkids, but for yours. For your great nieces and nephews and cousins and you know, whatever term, but the generations that come forward from this one, we all should be determined that they will never go through what we have to go through. That's why I do what I'm doing now. I'm the director of a project with Recovering from Religion called the Hotline Project. And it is, there isn't anything in the world like it. It is an absolutely brilliant thing. It's a 24-hour day hotline, which we're, we launched uh, several, a few months ago, I think five months ago. So we're weeknights and 24 hours a day on the weekend. Trained people are waiting on the phone for those who are dealing with issues of faith to call. And trust me, I would have given anything to have had this when I was struggling through everything that was going on with me. But the agents are trained not to judge. They're trained to not share their own personal belief, whatever that may be. They're trained not to lead the person, not to encourage them in one way or the other. They're trained to let that person talk, to give them a safe space, to let them explore what's going on inside of them and come to their conclusion, to provide them with resources, to give them the tools that they need to make a solid decision. Because the thing is, and I learned this, I was a pastor, I mean, come on, and I was an evangelical. If I can change your mind and I can convert you just by swaying you with my wonderful charisma or my intelligence or any of those things, all I've done is made a follower, a disciple of myself. And I'm on the way of creating a cult of personality, which I have no interest in. But if you have the space and have a friend who's not going, I mean, we can't be like them. We can't continually judge and expect things to get better. We can't continually do, be, you know, there's a difference between activism and aggressive, you know, assholery, maybe. <laughs> I just made that word up, don't you love it? There is a difference. And when you give a person a space, now, if I had called the hotline and I had had someone to talk to to work out the crazy stuff in my head and had the knowledge that that person wasn't going to be judging me or trying to persuade me or doing anything but just helping to direct the conversation so I can process all this stuff, it wouldn't have taken me so long. It wouldn't have been so difficult. That's the beauty of it. It's the absolute genius of the hotline project. Fully staffed by volunteers. I'm a volunteer. But Katniss was a volunteer. She stood up for her sister. And she said, no, 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 don't take her. I will go. Take me. That's what it takes, is that willingness to stand up. All of our agents, all our call agents, everybody that works tech support, everybody that volunteers for Recovering from Religion, and any other organizations that work toward this same goal, are doing the same exact thing. You're stepping out of that crowd and saying, no, 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 don't take me. I'll give you just a couple examples before I finish up. These are no names, and they were slightly altered to protect confidentiality. But this is the gist of the conversation. This person calls and says, and I know the light's a little bit difficult, but I'll, I'll read it for you. It says, I'm 16. Is it okay to talk to you? And our call agent reassures them, I'm scared. I'm so scared of going to hell. I have nightmares that I'm on fire. My dad says that it's God warning me. I don't think it's God, though. Is that bad? I don't believe in God anymore. Like when I was a kid, I loved my Legos. I didn't even make them, but I loved them. So I took care of them, you know. But that hell stuff, that's pretty bad. That's 16 years old. We have 
a, a large portion of our callers are young. I have one more. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just put me in the dark. I like it. We have a large portion of our callers who are young. We have a young girl, I think the youngest is 12 years old, struggling, nobody to talk to, living in a horrible situation where they know the parents are going to kick them out. You've seen the stories on YouTube and, and on the Internet where parents have literally just shoved them out the door because they no longer believe. Of one more. My parents said they won't let anyone in our house who doesn't accept Christ, even if it's their own kid. They don't know. The crying definitely intensifies with a call agent on the phone. I want to tell them. I have to tell them. They'll still love me, won't they? I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. The call agent says, I'm here to help. How old are you? Twelve. I'm 12. That's why we have to have hope. That's why we have to do this for this 12-year-old. 12, 12 years old, and she's already afraid. She's already living in this, this, this horrible place of fear. We have to do this, and for no other reason. We can't do it for ourselves. We have to do it for them. Steve, uh, Steve Jobs has this quote. When I was struggling with my faith, I found this. I guess because I like Apple computers, maybe. Who knows? Steve Jobs is always all over the news. But when I read this, it really, really hit home for me. Steve Jobs said, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. That's good words for us. Don't fall prey to dogma and other people's thinking. We don't follow Christian dogma, but we could create dogma of our own if we just follow someone else's thinking. Get connected. Find your own strength. Tap into it. Be brave. Be courageous. Know that you are. And hold on to hope. Live that hope. Chase after it if you have to. And when you have it, share it. Show it and live it. So that this 12-year-old girl, those who are going to be born in the future, and those who are sitting right beside you can see it. And they will be encouraged by it. Thank you. All right.